Thank you, Isabel. And uh, I think I should take this opportunity to express my gratitude to all the folks who over more than a year, two years, have uh, worked hard to get me to stand behind this podium and uh, also who've uh, made it possible for me to have such an enjoyable time with you folks. And that includes thanking some of you uh, who have come and uh, who have been uh, uh, inspiring faces to look at as I deliver these lectures. Now the theme of the lectures, as you uh, know, is modern homelessness. And I try to approach it by looking to ancient uh, texts, Hebrew Bible, texts, Hebrew Bible and the New Testament to see whether uh, there may be some uh, ways in which we can be, illuminate, can be illuminated about how and in what ways uh, can we be at home in the world and what homelessness might, uh, might mean. So the title of this lecture is On Being at Home. I'll try to pull out some of the threads that have been uh, left uh, unattended from previous lectures. So the inner dynamic of modernity has left many people homeless and for, for others made the experience of being at home in the world and in their own uh, private little castles difficult. Throughout modernity's history, however, people have longed for home and they continue to do so today. In much of the world, the principal sites of home building today are nuclear families, communities, larger communities, whether ethnic, cultural or national, unspoiled nature and religion. So let me take three of these uh, and elaborate a bit. Family is unique in its ability to sustain relations of resonance, deep attachment and mutuality. In a good family home, we are surrounded by people, things, maybe plants and animals that speak to us and for whom we deeply care. As partners, parents, children and siblings, we experience bonds that totally engage the self with each person being both an agent and a recipient, often of self-forgetful attention, each recognized for who he or she is. As an oasis of warmth and support, such a family home contrasts with the desert of a cold, calculating, competitive, frantic, and diffuse surrounding world. For many, family is the site of existential transcendence in daily life. But it takes great effort to keep the oasis fresh, and I think in exact also a certain kind of toll. The family home is threatened from within and from without. A good family, we said, is an oasis of warmth. But families are often not good. And even the good ones tend not to remain good for long. Competition, violence, and disdain can be even more intense inside than they're outside. Lack of care for the material space can make it feel dead and even hostile. Moreover, the boundary separating home from, outside the, from the outside world is permeable. Even when the home is an oasis, its dwellers go to the desert where they work, study, they play, and desert enters the home as economic, political, and entertainment winds blow in the sand. And then there is smartphone, a magical doorway into virtual space, and then oasis and desert can alternate from one movement of eyeballs to the next, from one click to the next. Keeping the sand completely out of the home oasis would require the kind of rigidity and violence that would undo the home. But even if deep resonance, attachment and mutuality survive the assault from within and without, would not this kind of intense mutual attention of familial home make it a space of self-absorption, a kind of selfishness in three or in five? What about home's own hospitality? What about its generosity and care? Generosity and care, not just of individuals in it, 
but for each other, but in their dwelling, but for neighbors, for the town, for the world. A sense that a family, let alone an individual, cannot survive in a desert and must care for more than itself to lead a meaningful life motivates much of the current interest in ethnic, racial, national and cultural identities, larger social and cultural homes in which family homes are nested. Families share language with the larger group, they have the same history and traditions, and face common dangers and can realize some possibilities only jointly. They also inhabit common spaces, towns, landscapes, geographic regions, countries. All of these aren't mere objects needed to survive and, pro survive and prosper, but sites of collective memory and shapers of ethnic, cultural, and national identities. We resonate with and are attached to our mother tongue, to the town square or town green, to the mountain range or the stretch of coast where you vis we used to visit. This large sense of us and ours rescues individuals and families from self-enclosure and competitiveness, connects them with the past and helps them imagine a future that is worth living or worth having. Identitarian movements in Europe demonstrate vividly the power of this longing for a communal home. As in the identitarians see it, I think in the UK it's generation identity, is that what the phrase is? I'm not entirely certain of your vocabulary. This is kind of French and, and kind of German uh, kind of phrasing. As identitarians see it, the tide of globalization has washed up on Europe's shore waves of non-white and Muslim migrants. In an act of what Camus Renault described as counter-colonization and the great replacement, they're invading and destroying the centuries-old ethnic and cultural homes of white Europeans. As Renault's fear-mongering rhetoric indicates, the longing for a communal home is not only powerful, it is also dangerous. The effort to maintain and rebuild the boundaries of communal homes, and no home can exist without boundary maintenance, easily turns into a struggle for purity, which then slides into angry celebration of one's own superiority. Pursuit of ethno-cultural at-homeness is at its worst when it is legitimized by denial of universally shared humanity. The mass of what all human beings share is then ignored in favor of the little that distinguishes them from each other. Primary for each person then becomes particular biological roots, distinct language and customs, exclusive territory of the group in the phrase the communal home ends up being primary. The price of such communal home is often loss of ability to share a home with those who differ from us and enmity toward them. Religions, that's my third example of homes. Religions constitute, continue to provide many with a sense of home. After the second lecture, it is hopefully evident why we think that Christian faith, the religion we embrace, can help us retrieve a sense of home and enrich our vision of home. Building on the relation of Jesus to home while keeping in mind the story of God's home in the world that we have sketched in the second lecture, we will say more about the short, or in short order, about the Christian vision of home. Again, for those who, for whom this is first lecture, the we is not a royal we. It, it is, it is uh, honoring the fact that contributing to this lecture is the work of my close collaborator, Ryan mcnally Vince. So we, <laughs> non-royal we. Consider fundamentalism, a peculiarly modern form of religiosity crafted largely to counter modern homelessness. It gives all-encompassing meaning and sense of belonging to millions of people throughout the globe. In some of its form, it does so at a heavy price. 
Instead of being a way of true life and source of joy, faith becomes a set of mind-closing dogmas, will-bending moral rules, and identity-boosting hostilities with God's Rottweilers guarding the boundaries. In embracing fundamentalism as a way of escaping the cold iron cage of modernity, people enter another cage, a traditional and enchanted one, but a cage nonetheless. We need all three of these nested homes, family, community, religion, to be at home in the world. But how do we structure them internally and how do we relate them to each other so as to guard from distortions? How do we craft, how do we craft ourselves internally so that we would actually feel at home in what we know are and should be our homes? The answer to this, this question, to answer these two questions is to find the solutions, solution to the problem of human homelessness the modern version of homelessness no less than the, than the perennial one. The gospel accounts of both Jesus' home and his homelessness set in the context of the entire history of God's homemaking from Eden to New Jerusalem can perhaps help in this quest. And that's where I'm going right now. I'm going to be reading gospels, not uh, looking behind them for a history, but the level of how they function at the level of the text. So, <clears throat> Jesus' home. Nazareth. Uh, when you enter in, in the Church of Annunciation, there's an altar, and on the altar it says the word was made, flesh. But then it adds one word, here. <laughs> the word was made flesh, here. <laughs> um, and anyway, that's why we start with Nazareth. <laughs> Nazareth, a little town of a little more than 300 at the time Jesus was uh, born, on the fringe of Roman Empire and never mentioned by any pre-Christian ancient text. That was Jesus' hometown, the place where he was conceived and the place where he grew up. It was largely an agrarian community with a few artisans like Jesus and his stepfather Joseph. Though Nazareth was in an abundantly fertile region, it, its, its inhabitants belonged to lower classes and were poor. Sepphoris, only four miles away, was a, an impressive city with courts, a fortress, a royal bank, an amphitheater seating three to four thousand people. But houses in the first century Nazareth wore small dwellings built with local stones, that were stacked roughly atop one another. The floors were packed earth and roofs thatch, constructed over beams of wood and held together with mud. Two or three homes were clustered together around an open courtyard. Much of life happened in this courtyard. It might contain the common cistern or a millstone for grinding grain, and animals would have been penned there as well. The children would mill around, and much of the cooking was done there as well in the courtyard. Jesus' home was marked with care and attentiveness, as witnessed by his parents anxiously searching for him where he seemed to have been lost in Jerusalem, and his obedience to his parents and respect for them. His family consisted of parents and siblings, at least in the Protestant reading of the story, and was part of a tightly knit cluster of relatives. Clustered dwellings shared often by members of extended family help foster close relationship and an ingrained sense of belonging. Culturally and genealogically, Jesus' material and social home was set within the arc spanning the centuries-long history of the people of Israel and its hoped-for continuation into the promised future. Rejoicing over her pregnancy, Mary sings about promises God made to Abraham and to his descendants forever. The study and the observance of law was important to the family. Jesus was circumcised on the eighth day and presented at the temple in accordance with the law. 
The family went on regular pilgrimages to the temple in Jerusalem, the center of life of the people of Israel, the national home. Though caring and affectionate, the home in which the young Jesus grew and increased in wisdom and stature and the divine favor did not revolve around itself and certainly not around his own little happiness and betterment. Divine law governed life in it, not private tastes and proclivities. Its purpose was not only its own thriving, but the good of the nation, especially of the hungry and lonely people oppressed by the powerful and the rich. This is a quote from Magnifica, or a summary of the Maris Magnifica. Like most other Jewish homes at the time, the home of Jesus was under intense pressure. We can sense that pressure in the kind of joy and hope that the birth of, the two bo uh, of Jesus elicited. God will install Jesus, we read in the beginning of Gospel of Luke, on the throne of his ancestor David. Jesus will bring down the powerful from their thrones and send away the rich empty. He will be the savior of all people, light of the for the revelation to, the, to Gentiles and for glory of the people of Israel. These promises of economic and political light were attractive because people lived in darkness of oppression. Most people in the region lived from hand to mouth, were liable to fall into debt and financial ruin, largely because of heavy taxation and died in their 30s. Jesus' early homelessness, his birth in Bethlehem, his flight to Egypt, was a direct consequence result of economic and political oppression. Consider Jesus' flight and exile in Egypt. Uh, again, let me repeat, I'm reading these stories at the level of the, of the text. The villain of the story is a local ru ruler, the erratic, cruel King Herod, for whom the imperial Rome supplied the throne and to whom taxes were due as well, in addition to taxes that the Rome demanded. He forces the family to flee because he fears for his throne. At the warning of an angel of the Lord, Joseph got up, took the child and his mother by night and went to Egypt and remained there. The flight to Egypt and the return from it is a symbolic reenactment of Israel's redemption from the slavery in Egypt. This theological significance of the story in the Gospels only underscores the burden of the exile. Like the children of Israel, Jesus too was a stranger in a foreign land and awaited the freedom and familiarity of home and of homeland. In childhood, Jesus was, experienced both home and homelessness. Home was his nurturing spiritual womb, to borrow a phrase from the great medieval theologian Thomas Aquinas. Homelessness was life-diminishing and life-threatening exposure. As an adult, too, Jesus experienced both home and homelessness. In his childhood, home and homelessness was in sharp contrast. In his adulthood, the contrast between home and homelessness gives way to something like a productive tension between them. The tension is deep and it is also ineliminable. But why tension and what is its character, tension between home and homelessness? For the most of his brief public life, Jesus was a homeless, itinerant herald of the kingdom of God, teacher, a teacher and a healer. Famously, he said of himself, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his hand. As the verse implies, homelessness is not a value in its own right. For almost 30 years, Jesus lived at home. He became homeless sometime after his baptism, calling, and subsequent temptation in the desert. But he initially, even after that, carried his mission from home. And even when he was homeless, an itinerant preacher, he made use of homes of sympathizers 
and non-itinerant disciples. The most prominent example is the home of Martha, Mary, and Lazarus in Bethany, where he stayed overnight during the very last phase of his ministry when he taught at the temple before his crucifixion. The two poles of, these, of the tension between home and homelessness in Jesus' life were these. Home was a basic positive good, so much so that we cannot imagine Jesus becoming Jesus and his mission being what it was without him having the kind of home he had. But the sec second, the life of homelessness was a consequence of doing what God called him to do and being who God called him to be. In the tension between home and homelessness in the life of Jesus after the return from Egypt, home was def a default setting and homelessness a required exception. Home could be assumed homelessness, especially as it was elective after the flight in Egypt, required justification. So why homelessness? Let's first eliminate one possible explanation. What might think that the devotion to God required a kind of homelessness? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength is the first and the greatest commandment. You shall therefore love God more than you love your home, the dwelling place, and the members of the household more than the nation, more than the entire terrestrial realm. Now the call of Abraham to go from his country, his kindred, and his father's house illustrates this point really well. The dark story of Abraham's near sacrifice of Isaac underlines the point in red ink, in being willing to do the unthinkable and sacrifice his most beloved son at God's request, Abraham was willing to give up both on being the father of a son and on being the father of the nation. But even if devotion to God towered above familiar, national, and terrestrial ties, it was by no means incompatible with them, with those ties. Love for God did not require homelessness. To the contrary, it required love of home and love for all neighbors and their true homes. For it was God, the creator of all living things, who promised Abraham that he would have a son, that his offspring would become a nation, and that through him and the nation of which he would be pro progenitor, all families of the earth would be blessed. So devotion to God requires home building. It does not as such require elective homelessness of the kind that both Abraham and Jesus in fact practiced. The root of that homelessness is not the belief in God, but the conviction to put it in my jargon now, that the world has unhomed itself. Abraham was homeless because in response to the call of the one God, he left his original home with its idols and journeyed to the land of promise without ever being able to take it into possession. Jesus was homeless because he was a witness to the world as God's home, to the reign of God, kingdom of God coming into the world, and because this witness elicited resistance. He announced it in word and deed that God was coming as the rightful owner of the house of Israel and later in his ministry of the entire world. Small islands like families could not become fully flourishing homes. Neither could large islands like cities or nations. For one person, one family, one town, one city to be at home, the entire terrestrial realm had to be at home. Speaking, spreading the message throughout his native region of Galilee and then beyond required traveling and therefore homelessness. Mission then 
was the first reason for Jesus' elective homelessness. The second reason was that the message and the messengers were rejected, even persecuted. Home requires mutuality, and to the extent that his vocation was explicitly rejected by his erstwhile home, it could no longer be fully, be fully his home. Alternative visions of both familial and national homes are at stake. The nature of God and the way devotion to God shapes building and maintaining familial and national homes, as well as the strategy of coming to eventually repossess them from the imperial and colonial Rome. The need to proclaim a message that concerned the entire world required itinerancy. Jesus had to leave his familial home. The rejection of that message precluded him from, be, from him from being at home anywhere but in the company of his followers. Not in his own hometown and not among his own people. The final result of that rejection was the utter homelessness of a shameful death on the cross outside the city gate. According to the witness of the Christian faith, the crucified Jesus was raised and continues to live both at the right hand of God in glory and in the church and in the world. The community of those who followed him while he was still an itinerant herald, who were for a brief period utterly disoriented by his death, uh, they were to continue his, they continued his mission starting with the place where it ended and continuing to the ends of the earth. If any want to become my followers, Jesus said while still on earth, let them deny themselves and take up they, their cross daily and follow me. Before his death, the saying remained opaque to them because they could not fathom him being crucified. After his resurrection, the conditional, if anyone wants to follow me, became an imperative that defined the self-understanding of the disciples. To follow Christ is to take up the cross and to participate in his mission. The only way to save one's life is to be willing to lose it by working for the salvation of others, those who are near and those who are far off. We noted earlier tension between home and homelessness in the life of Jesus. That tension was not unique to him, part of a vocation that was exclusively his. It was also to be characteristic of Jesus' followers, both before his crucifixion and after his resurrection. For them too, home was both a positive good and a space they had to leave even to turn their back on. The core of the original disciples, disciples literary, literally followed Jesus and thus emulated his homelessness. The first ones bore by trade fishermen when he called them into his own mission they pulled their boats up the shore and left everything and followed him. Disciples had to leave home, not just to be with Jesus, but also to be sent out to proclaim the message to towns and villages, to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, as the text says. And yet their homelessness, like homelessness of Jesus, does not involve blanket rejection or criticism of home. They were not only to stay at home of the people in towns and villages to which they came, but they were also to pronounce blessing of peace over them. Moreover, the entire time they were with him, uh, with Jesus, um, or when they were traveling on their own, they, they kept in their position, possession, they kept in their possession the homes which they left behind. So there's a tension-filled, dynamic relation between home and elective homelessness in the lives of his disciples um, after the resurrection. The community of disciples, the church, was proclaiming the good news of God's coming to make home in the world that has unhomed itself. 
The home of God is larger and more significant than any single home, whether familial or national or imperial. Individual homes are particular, demarcated social physical spaces. God's home is universal, encompassing the entire world. Individual homes are marked by differences of lineage, language, economy, and rule. God's home transcends and encompasses those differences. Correspondingly, boundaries of lineage, culture, language, culture, race cannot define the community of Jesus' followers. This is what Jesus implied when he responded publicly to information that his mother and his brothers had come and wanted to speak to him. He said, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And pointing to the disciples, he said, here are my brothers and my, my, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother, sister, and mother. Its very character, in its very character, and not just through its proclamation, the church was supposed to witness to the coming of God to make the entire world God's home. Given Jesus' statement about family, it may be tempting to think that for early Christians, churches were their true homes. And indeed, in the discussion, I think after first or second lecture, somebody suggested uh, as much. In the second lecture, we saw that a dominant strand of biblical traditions sees the entire world as the terrestrial temple, a space of God's presence. In the New Testament, temple is one of the dominant metaphors for the church. Ecclesial communities centered on Jesus Christ as the corner store or capstone could then be the true homes in contrast to inadequate familiar or national homes. People would then have to leave those inadequate homes and join ecclesial communities as their homes. But that's actually not what early Christians did. True, early Christian communities gathered in houses. There were house churches. So if you read in some of the Paul's epistles, there was a, there was a church in Nymphas house church in Appius and Archippus' house. You've never heard those names, right? <laughs> um, yet they were important uh, folks uh, at the time uh, of who, in whose home churches met. But that did not turn the homes of these good folks that are hard to pronounce into churches. The community lived scattered in their own homes, but gathered for meetings at the house of one of its members. Christian communities are not homes. I think they're better described as meta-homes, communities of those who in fellowship with Jesus Christ, the Word become flesh, and in the power of the Spirit seek to love God above all things and their neighbors as themselves. They have consciously inserted themselves into the story of everything, committing themselves to participate in God's project of making the world into God's home and therefore to align their ordinary homes, familial, urban, national homes, with the vision of that one terrestrial home of God with the goal of God's history with the world. Now we have given an account of Jesus and disciples' relation to home and homelessness set in the great arc of the world's creation and completion, whose one end is Eden and the other New Jerusalem. Now the question is, with which I will conclude my lectures, what bearing does it have on the way we should build and maintain our familiar and national homes in the one fragile terrestrial space that we inhabit? So I have five points to make. First. Universal horizon. It is remarkable that a simple family some 2,000 years ago in a minuscule house in an utterly, un utterly unremarkable town of Nazareth would closely link their own very personal joys and sufferings to the fate of the entire people 
to the promises made to their great ancestor Abraham, to the hope that a new ruler, a descendant of the King David, who embodied their long faded national glory, all of this, that uh, they would, it would free them from the wrong. They have imagined all of this because God who has set foundations of the earth is faithful to the promise to dwell among the people of Israel. This is one long sentence. It's, it's, it's actually well, well written, but was badly read. <laughs> my, my apologies for, for, for butchering my own sentence uh, here, but you, you get the basic idea. Uh, in a minuscule little place, universal horizon of hopes, Managing a household with a dirt floor under her feet and thatched roof over her head and none of the modern conveniences, the matriarch of the family imagined herself and her family as part of God's coming to redeem the entire world. Contrast this ancient woman and her family with an average middle-class person in post-industrial modern societies. Our dwellings have greatly improved and our life, our lived world has vastly expanded, but the horizon of our expectation, the horizon of our concern seems to have greatly shrunk, diminished to our little familial oasis, if we are lucky, and often extending no further than the edges of our own fragile selves. That's perhaps partly because the world economic, of economics and politics, of technology and entertainment has grown complex beyond our knowledge and control, imposing itself relentlessly on us and in exchange offering myriads of immediate gratifications. But the story of Jesus' home and the mission which led him to homelessness underscores that hope for the self is linked to the flourishing of the familial home and that the hope for the familial home is linked to the hope for the nation and the world, though they're not fully determined by those, but they clearly cannot be realized fully without hope for these larger homes. The conviction that the whole world would be completed when it becomes God's home underscores that the full flourishing of each person and of each of the parallel and nested homes must all happen together. Now, you, 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 might, you might say that this reading of, um, you may suspect my reading of biblical text, but, but I, think, I think I'm right on the universality. And you may suspect the, the kind of clandestine Marxist vision here, right? Because this was Marx's vision, right? The, the, the entirety of the revolution can occur only at the same, or one time and the same time everywhere, right? Only then can you have anything like communism. It didn't happen that way. Hmm. I wonder why. Second, expansive identities. Homes are bounded spaces, walls, dirt floor, thatched roof, town, region, nation, particular climate, biological and non-biological family members, and extended family language, customs, religion, they're all boundaries of homes that both separate them from and link them to that which is outside. But homes, as we have argued, are not things, but specific relations among people and between people and things. Importantly, the relations that constitute home are not only external, with one relation, unaffected entity, relating to another relation, unaffected identity. Instead, relations partly define the persons who make up homes, as well as these distinct homes with regard to other homes. I am at home only when home is not just around me, but when home is also in me, which is to say, in a certain sense, when I, am, when I am that particular home. Similarly, for home to be in me, I need to be in each other member of the home and in their mutual interchanges, 
they individually and together need to experience me as being part of them. This is a consequence of the mutuality of which I spoke earlier as a condition of being at home. What we just described are relations of mutual indwelling without erasure of boundaries. We see them in the idea of persons that are temple of God, the community of which these persons are part of that same temple of God, and that all God's people of which these communities are part are also part of that same temple of God. They are in each other and in God, as, uh, and God is in them as well. This complex idea at the heart of at-homeness is more clearly expressed in the image of the New Jerusalem as the Holy of Holies, the site of God's presence, which is situated in God as a temple to which it belongs. So God is a temple, Holy of Holies, New Jerusalem is in God, God is in the, in the Holy of Holies, right? That's the idea of mutual indwelling. Put simply, we are at home when two things happen. When we are in all those who make up home and the entity, the entities that make up home are in us. Right? So that's a close identification. <clears throat> Third, dynamic relations. Struggles for power. Tracking of benefits given and received. Setting down rules and punish, punishing their infractions. These are all part of life in every earthly home. We can see these dynamics in the story of the prodigal, which is both a story about a concrete familial home and the parable of the way in which God comes to dwell in the world as God's home. If we did not assume the struggles between the two brothers and their calculations of interest, if we did not think that some basic rules were broken, the story would not work. But the reason why home can be for so many an image of wholeness, even an utopian object of longing, is that the very idea of home contains the promise of a social space in which power struggles, individual interests, and observance of rules do not have the last word. Not that how we behave does not matter at home, to the contrary. It matters profoundly. Even smallest things do, like a shift in a mood or a character of a glance. But once this commitment is gone, commitment to home is gone, we start either to live as domestic exiles in a shell of a home or we depart from the home even while still remaining in it. As a social space, home depends on the ability and willingness of its members, one, to keep adjusting their identities, allowing others' journeys to take them on the adventure of their own transformation, two, willingness to repent, forgive, and even forget, and in this way bear each other's burdens, and three, for all to celebrate, celebrate the good that others are and others do, however limited and compromised that good might be. Fourth, making room. A simple phrase from the story of Jesus' birth has reverberated through the centuries with its haunting anguish. No room. Jesus was born homeless, not just because the command of the great Caesar Augustus would not accommodate a young and very pregnant woman at the edge of the empire, but because there was no room for her in the inn, no room for her child to be born, no room for Christ, who according to the Gospels is every unborn, newborn, every prison, every hungry and persecuted image of God. Every human being needs and must have room, must have home. That's what the story of the first human home 
imagined as an entire world underscores. Before God could create humans, God had to create a specific place which they would make or help make into their home and God's home. For there to be no room for any human being, for any particular human being in the world, is an ontological blasphemy, an affront to God, against God and against God's world. There are places that are so crowded and chaotic, so ungarden-like and uncity-like that it is impossible for humans to make a home in them, or at least impossible to make a home worthy of being human. We will, I will speak to this problem shortly. There may be also places which can no longer absorb newcomers, at least for a while. Bethlehem's Inn might have been just such one place, but more often than not, behind the scarcity, scarcity of room and homes are the people, to quote the prophet, who join house to house, who add field to field, until there is no room for anyone but you. And you are left to live alone in the midst of the land. No more room is often the policy of those who want pure home and homeland, unsullied by people from shithole countries to use a new presidential locution, or those embracing reviled religion. But giving room and making space is not yet creating a home. Bethlehem's Inn might have been perhaps a comfortable place for Mary to give birth, but it would not have been home. Giving room to a stranger and an immigrant, like any significant encounter, partly changes the recipient home, even after the guest has left. If a stranger moves in or immigrant settles, the change deepens and becomes permanent. In dynamic interplay with the original members, the stranger or immigrant will bend the material and social space of their new home so that they too can feel at home in it. As we have noted earlier, such ongoing adjustment of identity is basic to the life of any home. It is only accelerated when newcomers are part of it. As members of any merged family can attest, and as current immigration debates and clashes clearly illustrate the reciprocal identity alignments necessary for creation and maintenance of common home can be very difficult. Alternative visions of home, distinct settled patterns of resonance and attachment that confer a sense of identity, that orient life and give its meaning, these often collide. While the conflicting parties may each have a physical space that could be home, none of them often feels at home. Home is a set of relations of resonance and attachment to people, things and places is then lost. The recovery takes persistent, strenuous and vitally important work. Which brings me to my fifth point, building homes. The openness to host the openness of host homes for newcomers is crucial. Such openness cannot be the main strategy for combating social and physical homelessness. Even if it were su successful, the entire process would aim in the wrong direction, toward abstract cosmopolitanism with only highly attenuated sense of belonging to particular places, cultures and persons. The main strategy should be to create a world full of constellation of multiple smaller homes nested within various larger homes and all with passable boundaries, each shaped by some combination of common familial ties, language, common lineage, common histories, common religious orientation, common mores, common natural and built locales and more. The story of Jesus and his followers especially after his resurrection, can provide perhaps a useful model. 
His followers spread throughout the Roman Empire were one church. But the one church was made up of many churches, each of them speaking its own language. That requires a sense of connection with and care for, not just for one's own local church, but for churches at the other end of the world. The entire history of God with creation aims at making this world, entire world, into true home for everyone, a home in which God dwells and in which everyone is at home and feels at home. Jesus own mission, his homelessness, even to the point of being killed as a rebel, blasphemer, and outcast, has the same aim. The church participates in this mission. It continues the journey of Abraham, who was in Christian telling on a pilgrimage to a city whose architect and builder is God. The God of the Bible is a home builder, and so are the worshipers of this God. The vision is not one abstract cosmopolitanism, but the terrestrial realm as home of homes. The mission is both simple and seemingly impossible. Building and rebuilding one home at a time until in fulfillment of the ancient prophecy, all sit under their own wine, vines and under their own fig tree and no one makes them afraid. Creating cities in which children can play and laugh on the streets and in parks, in which arts and sciences thrive, in which people and which people can love. Building nations in which rule is shared and in which justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like flowing stream. Devoting our energy to heal our terrestrial home to flourish so that we can see and hear, as the psalmist puts it, the earth rejoice, the sea roaring, and all that fills it. We can hear the field exalt and everything in it, and all the trees of the forest sing for joy. Working to adjust global economic systems to counter the logic of escalation, propensity to ra for reification, pervasiveness of competitiveness in struggle, this all is involved in helping each one of us have a home and be at home. And one more thing, to have a home, we need to overcome our metaphysical homelessness. The world itself is not a thing, not even a dynamic network of living things. In the Christian story of everything, the world appears as creation. There can be no creation without a creator. The God who is not one item in the universe, but the one who is radically other and who makes possible the entirety of what is not God in all its dynamic complexity. Creation, the world, is a gift and therefore it is a relation as well as we have said the homes are. Somebody, God, gives something, all interdependent creatures, to someone else, to each particular creature. To recognize the world as a gift properly is to recognize the world as God's home and our home. At the very end of these three lectures, let us return very briefly to Ernst Bloch, with whom we started these lectures. The story of God with creation centered on Jesus as God's homeless home among humans and culminating in the New Jerusalem is about, as he put it, true genesis at the end. That story is an invitation to make our nested homes, family home, city home, homeland, earth home, reflect in some measure that coming home of God which completes the creation. Just for that reason, that story is also an invita invitation to a certain kind of elective homelessness, which the home building in the world that has unhomed itself has always required. 
Thank you very much.